Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. It was planned a little bit, then there came a conversation, then there was the question, do we do it, do we not do it? We, yeah, Tom is back, Tom Fress is back with Jörg on Hour of the Truth, Inquisition update and Hour of the Truth back together, doing some work that needs to be redone and some work that needs to be finished and probably some work that needs to be done all started all over again completely anew let's say a new study so we um let me tell you one thing when i'm driving my cab mostly in weekends when i have full days sometimes i do a long ride and i'm very long even alone in my car and then i have recordings of tom fress when he was on first amendment radio doing his thing meaning reading wonderful uh, Protestant books. And in 2011, I heard him read from Lorraine Bettner's book, Roman Catholicism. And I was very much impressed by that. I'm still listening to that. And even the last recording that I listened to, I listened to four or five times. It was so impressive. And that deals with a chapter in the book about tradition in the Roman Catholic Church. So that's one thing that we are going to talk about. The other thing that we are talking about is that you maybe remember when you followed Tom Fress on First Amendment, First Amendment Radio at the time, that at his last work that he did there, he was reading from John Dowling, History of Romanism, a very, very big, 850 pages big book, fantastic work, and he didn't finish it on First Amendment Radio. And we are thinking about going back into that book here, but not really at the moment where he stopped, because there's another part that we find very interesting in, I think it was chapter five or book five, it was called chapter one, and that deals with the time of uh, Pope Gregory VII, also called Hildebrand, until the time of um, Pope Boniface VIII in uh, 1302, and you know him with Unam Sanctum, and you probably know um, the work from Gregory VII, Dictatus Papai, and then you're going to put Dictatus Papai and Unam Sanctum together, and what do you get? Well, that's probably another part of our study, and those are the things that are to be redone, Romanism, uh, Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Bettner, finished, uh, the history of Romanism by John Dowling, and then comes some future study. But that's not for today to say. And I already talked much longer than I actually wanted. I wanted to give Tom the floor. I'm so glad that Tom is back. Please, Tom, and give your motivation to do everything that I just explained that we are probably going to do. Here you go. Yes, very well, Jörg, and it's uh, my pl pleasure, privilege, and uh, blessing to be here and to return a uh, uh, to this uh, this most, most important discussion. And I want to begin by refreshing the listeners' memories that Rome has sought to destroy Protestantism. It's vital for Rome's continuation that it destroy Protestantism. Because Protestantism is the truth, and Roman Catholicism is the lie, and the lie cannot stand the light of the truth. Such is the case between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, as is Christ and Antichrist. The darkness cannot stand in the face of the light and survive. So it's important for the Antichrist to destroy Christ, and that's been its occupation from the beginning. And it's Rome's, uh, it's Rome's necessary action to destroy Protestantism, to snuff out the light of truth. And that effort began with the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was convened as a result of the Protestant Reformation, the rebellion of many high-ranking, influential uh, uh, Roman Catholic teachers, preachers, 
potentates and uh, 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 monks and nuns who finally came to the realization that the scripture is God's word and in the scripture it warns of the papal antichrist. They finally comprehended that the Bible, when it spoke of the antichrist and its false doctrines, was literally talking about their church and their popes. And they came out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest. They protested the papal antichrist. They knew from scripture and from history and from common sense that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. So they came out of the Roman Catholic Church first in an attempt to reform that church, and then later realizing that the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan, cannot be reformed. It is what it is, and it's put in this world to be what it is until Christ's return. And so they stopped any hope, an effort to reform the Roman Catholic Church, and they came out of her, as is encouraged by the Scripture in Revelation chapter 18. All right, as a result of that coming out in protest of the Roman Catholic Church, acknowledging that it is the synagogue of Satan, acknowledging that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, that Rome decided, oh, someone has turned on the light. We have to extinguish the light. So they convened a council. It was called the Council of Trent. And what it was accomplished, it was run by the Jesuits. The Jesuits organized it. They are the, they are the shock troops. They are the front, uh, the front lines assailants against Protestantism. They are sworn by bloody oaths to destroy Protestantism, lock, stock, and barrel, no matter what it costs. Okay? The darkness absolutely must snuff out the light because it can't stand in the presence of the light. Okay? So the ultimatum was given to the Protestants. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church or die. That was the, the whole mission of the Protestant Reformation, of the, rather, the Council of Trent. It was an ultimatum. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church, submit yourselves to the authority of the papacy, or else. And there were, in the Council of Trent, listed every heretical and anti-biblical and anti-Christ doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. And it was reestablished as dogma and it pronounced curses to anyone who did not accept the papal authority and his antichrist doctrines, his false doctrines. And it established the, the, the rules. This is the ultimatum. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church, and here's what you're coming back to. The Pope is the ultimate authority. Scripture and tradition are, are the purview of the church, and you have no independent interpretations of your own. You're not even allowed to read the scriptures for yourself. You must do, think, and say whatever the church tells you to do, think, and say. Your salvation is wrapped up in the Roman Catholic Church and nowhere else. The Roman Catholic Church and the papacy has replaced Christ you cannot consult Christ, you must consult the church. Okay? That was what that that's what the Council of Trent was, lock, stock, and barrel. Now, one of the greatest weapons to destroy Protestantism, as established by the Council of Trent, was what we call futurism. The Protestants believed that the Antichrist was revealed in the papacy, and that every pope from the first to the last is the Antichrist of his day, that the Antichrist is an institution that never dies. While popes come and go, as is common to man, the papacy never dies. 
and the papacy is the Antichrist, and it has deceived the whole world. That is what Protestantism is. Now, Futurism says that the, the Antichrist won't be revealed until the distant future, just seven years before Christ returns. Okay? So Rome, established by the Jesuits at the Council of Trent, the mastermind to destroy Protestantism was to take away from them the belief and teaching that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist and pin the tail of the Antichrist on a donkey right at the end of time. So you can't continue to call the Pope the Antichrist. You can't continue to call the Roman Catholic Church the synagogue of Antichrist the synagogue of Satan, the counterfeit Christ, the counterfeit church, which is what the Protestants called it, okay? And that is now what has been taught in the Protestant and evangelical churches since the early 1800s. That the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel will come at the very end of time. It's called the seven years of great tribulation when the Antichrist will finally be revealed in the world. But that's not what Protestantism is. Protestantism is the first pope was the Antichrist. The second pope was the Antichrist. The third pope was the Antichrist. The fourth pope was the Antichrist. What we have, 266 popes at this day and age is was and always will be the Antichrist. The Antichrist was revealed long, long ago. That's Protestantism. If you don't believe this, then you can't call yourself a Protestant. Okay? And you have no fellowship with anybody in the world that says the Antichrist has never been revealed. He won't be revealed until the end of time. That is a futurist. That is an apostate. That is a deceiver. That is a confounder of the truth. That is the, the bucket of cold water that is splashed on the fire of the truth. And it must be dispelled. It must be revealed as heresy. It must be exposed and condemned as error. The truth is what the Protestant reformers said it was. The light stood up at the time of the Protestant Reformation and put the darkness to flight. But they didn't run for long. They turned around and faced the light and tried to snuff it out with futurism. Now, futurism has run its course. It started to be taught in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries and colleges in the early 1800s. It has run its course. It has deceived the whole Protestant and evangelical world. There isn't anybody hardly that can be named that still believes that the Pope or the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. To them, Roman Catholicism is just another denomination of Christianity. And I'm here to tell you, anyone who calls Roman Catholicism Christianity has blasphemed the name of Christ. They cannot tell the difference between Christ and Antichrist. They are not to be listened to. They are not to be emulated. They are not to be believed. They're certainly not to be obeyed, and they are to be repudiated. And if there's a pastor behind your pulpit that preaches futurism, that the Antichrist has not been revealed in the world, he should be fired forthwith. And the light of the truth can finally stand up behind the pulpit and tell the truth, because the darkness cannot stand to stand in the light of the truth. But what are your pastors doing today? Now that Protestantism has been destroyed and futurism has replaced the historicist truth, they're telling you that Roman Catholicism is Christianity and we have a, a command of the Lord to unite. 
And now that we no longer believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and that the Antichrist is somebody that won't even come on the world scene until the last seven years before Christ returns, well, then we need to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. We need to make reparations to the Roman Catholic Church. We need to pay for our grievous error called the Protestant Reformation because it was based on falsehoods. It was based on the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, and now we believe that the Antichrist's future has never been revealed. So the Protestant Reformation was a gross injustice to the man of God in Rome. It's called the ecumenical movement, and it is a result of the belief in futurism that Daniel's 70th week was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, but it will be fulfilled in the future by the Antichrist who will finally be revealed in the world. Now do you see how deception has just universally corrupted the truth? Universal apostasy. And we can't come to the truth till we, re till we admit our error. Futurism is a diabolical, Jesuit-inspired error so that we would forget that the papacy is the Antichrist and that we would tolerate him and seek to reunite with him. The man of sin, the son of perdition. That's what Vatican Council II was. The ultimatum in Vatican Council II in, 19, in the 1960s was You've admitted the papacy is not the Antichrist. You believe in a future Antichrist. Therefore, you must come back to Rome or die. You must come back to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. You must submit to the authority of the, man, of, of, of the, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the papacy, the one you falsely accused of being the Antichrist back at the time of the Protestant Reformation. You now admit with all your belief and all your teaching that that was wrong. So you now you must come back with your tail between your legs and return to Roman Catholicism and eat that lock, stock, and barrel. And Vatican Council II was an ultimatum. You've said with your own mouth the Antichrist is future. You've said with your own mouth since the early 1800s that the papacy is not the Antichrist. Now you have to come back to Rome. And now the prerogative of every Protestant evangelical pastor is to see to it that you do go back to Rome. You submit to Roman authority. You come under the purview of the Roman Catholic Church. You are one of her sheep. And you must bow and kiss the ring and the slippered toe of the Pope, the man of sin. Every Protestant and evangelical pastor in this country is saddled with the responsibility, with or without your knowledge, to return you to the authority of the man of sin in Rome. And if he does not do it, he'll be replaced. Okay, if you've got a pastor behind your pulpit that's talking like Tom Fress, he'll be replaced. And you don't have any say in it anymore. See, it used to be the churches picked their own pastor. The Holy Spirit was involved in picking the pastor and the bishop of the churches. The, the elders were, were the body of men from which the, the authorities of the churches were appointed or picked by the Holy Spirit, by either by drawing of straws or, or prayerful intercession or by, by whatever means. But the Holy Spirit, God picked the leaders of the church. Now they're picked by board members, men, sinful, wicked men who are following the dictates of Rome. And so Vatican Council II was a turning point. You either come back to Rome or else. It was the conclusion of what was started at the Council of Trent. The ultimatum was given. You come back to Rome or else. 
Vatican Council II was saying, you believe that the Antichrist is future. You no longer believe the papacy is the Antichrist. Therefore, now you got to come back to Rome. Time's up. And God intervened. And before he left his people to their own devices, he made sure that a man by the name of Lorraine Bettner, Mr. Lorraine Bettner, wrote a book that came out at the time of Vatican Council II called Roman Catholicism. And it was written by a former Roman Catholic, Mr. Lorraine Bettner. And he knew what Roman Catholicism was. He knew what it believes. He knew what it taught. And he warned the, the entire Protestant and evangelical world what your Protestant and evangelical pastors are buying for you. What about that primrose path to perdition that your Protestant and, and evangelical pastors are leading you toward? so that you can make a fully educated decision. What is Roman Catholicism? You see, since futurism began to be taught in the Protestant evangelical churches in the early 1800s, it wasn't polite discussion to talk about the errors of Rome. It wasn't polite to discuss the Antichrist of Rome. It wasn't a polite conversation to point out the false doctrines, the wicked practices, the false traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist doctrines and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. It was impolite to point out the error of the man of sin in Rome. And so churches have had to put a gag in their mouth Protestant and evangelical churches, which were formerly protesters of the man of sin in Rome, and shouted it from the rooftops that no one ever be deceived by Rome. Now they were forced to put a rag in their mouth, shut them up. And then to make that desirable, they started to teach that the Antichrist is never going to be revealed until just before Christ returns. Seven years before Christ returns, he's going to make a peace treaty with the Jews. They're going to build a temple. They're going to begin animal sacrifices again. Never mind that Daniel prophesied that he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, as Jesus did in the midst of the week, three and a half years after his baptism. No, the Antichrist was going to make a peace treaty with the Jews and allow them to build a temple and resume animal sacrifices again, as if God was going to honor them. That's what they've been teaching in the Protestant and evangelical churches since the early 1800s. It's a lie. It's a damnable lie. It's heresy. It's blasphemy. It's absolutely false. It is the darkness that the light seeks to expose. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm going to read and discuss Mr. Lorraine Bettner's book about Roman Catholicism so these listeners can determine for themselves and see for themselves the wicked pied pipers that their pastors, their Protestant and evangelical pastors are in preaching an ecumenical reunion with the Antichrist of the Roman Catholic Church and all of his false doctrine. And if you call this hate speech, you'll get no argument from me. I hate the man of sin. I hate what he's done to God's people. I hate what he's done in my life. And I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. I'm going to educate God's people. For as many people who will sit and listen to me, I'm going to tell them the truth. The light is going to expel the darkness. And if you want to know the truth, Keep listening, because we're going to talk about the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to tell you what the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church are, what authority they have in the Antichrist Roman Catholic Church. And we're going to show you what your Protestant, your apostate Protestant and evangelical pastors have bought for you. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. 
So instead of start reading the book on the very first page, because of the impression that I got from this chapter for the tradition, and as Tom already said, that tradition is what the Roman Catholic Church is built upon, and that the Bible is what Protestantism or real Christianity is built upon, those two are absolutely contradictive to each other. But the Roman Catholic Church not only says that um, the Bible is not the basis of all um, authority and dogmas, but tradition and the Bible, and if uh, push comes to shove, it is even tradition above the Bible. And this is all things that we are going to read here. I think as a basis, this is a very important chapter, this chapter tradition. And you see, we deal with, first and for all, we explain what tradition is, how tradition nullifies the word of God, because that's exactly what the Council of Trent was all about that Tom mentioned. 120 something anathemas were spoken against people who adhere to the Bible instead of tradition, because tradition nullifies the word of God, nullifies the Bible. We are going to tell you where the apocryphal books actually come from, what the apocrypha is, the nature of the apocryphal books. We're going to speak about the Vulgate and the modern translations of the Bible. We speak about the question of authority which for a Christian it's easy, it's Jesus Christ, which for a Roman Catholic is easy, it's the Pope. <laughs> and we're going to discuss that. Who's right? We are speaking about tradition that is condemned by scriptures. I remember Jesus saying to the scribes and the Pharisees that they, with their tradition, made it impossible for the Jews even to keep the law. We are speaking about the Protestant attitude toward the Bible. We are speaking about the Roman Catholic attitude toward the Bible. And you will see they are not the same. I can assure you that. And then we're speaking about interpreting the Bible. Well, that is a very dangerous point, if you ask me. Because eisegesis, exegesis, or hermeneutic, as it is all called in kindly strange words, is nothing else but interpreting the Bible. And the point is that a true Bible, like the King James 1611, the Tom and I only read, interprets itself and therefore is void of any personal interpretation. Because personal interpretation is what is on the basis of false, not only, but most and for all, Roman Catholic dogma. And interpretation then leads to tradition, <laughs> which circles the point why we are reading this chapter, I think it's chapter four, yeah, chapter four of this book from Lorraine Butner, Tradition. Now, technically, the point is, as you can see, I have the book here as a PDF, which has 402 PDF pages. Tom, on the other side of the ocean, holds the book in his hand, as we are speaking here right now. Now, the quote-unquote problem could be that what I read is not exactly what he holds in his hand, because I don't have a PDF of his book, I have a PDF that I took off the internet. This is the first meeting together, if there is any um, difference between the two, we will establish that today, and then I will see to get another book, um, or, or this book in another version, or maybe Tom can also hold this his PDF version up or can read from the screen. I don't know. But the point is, we are going to, for, to read from this book and we are going to start on what tradition is. Tom, do you want me to do the introductional reading and you uh, interrupt me wherever it is suitable for you to have a comment? Or do you want to read yourself? Well, I, I think I'll begin at least to read until my voice goes away. But... Uh... I want the listeners to know that before we even start, we're talking about tradition. Now, now the scripture condemns tradition. Full well, you reject the commandments of God by keeping your own traditions. Okay? The traditions of men always are in conflict with the written will of God. Okay? Men choose to worship God their own way instead of the way that is 
enumerated for them in writing in the scripture. Okay. Uh, tradition is always corrupt. Now, tradition is held to be equal with the Bible in Roman Catholicism. And further, the Roman Catholic Church declares itself to be the sole repository of Christian tradition. No one else has it. Only the Roman Catholic Church has it. Only the Roman Catholic Church teaches it. Only the Roman Catholic Church is the author and purveyor of it. You can't get it anywhere else. And uh, the Bible is said, at least on its face, to be equal with tradition. But you'll see as we continue to read, or as we begin to read, rather, that tradition nullifies the Scripture. That's what its whole purpose is. Now, look, Rome tells us that these traditions that they hold that really define their faith is oral traditions that were passed down from Jesus and the apostles that were never written down. They were oral traditions. And that they've been passed down through the generations and now are the responsibility of the Roman Catholic Church. That the Roman Catholic Church alone is the repository of all those oral traditions. Now, Rome says certain things were taught by Jesus and the apostles that are not included in Scripture. Okay, you see where this is going? Right away, tradition nullifies the Scripture because there's no proof of it. Where we have Scripture and history to back up Scripture, we have no proof of anything on oral tradition. Okay? And it, 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 you just have to believe by faith that the Roman Catholic Church literally has these teachings, that they're passed down to them, that they are the repository of it, and they are the only interpreters of it and the only dispensers of it. And you can't know the truth unless you get it from them alone. Okay? You see what that does to the Scriptures? Because in the Scriptures, you think you have the Word of God, right? You think you have everything that's necessary for salvation in the scriptures, right? But Rome says, no, the scriptures alone are not all there is to salvation. The scriptures alone are not all there is to holy living. You have to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. Otherwise, you don't have any possession of these so-called traditions, these holy traditions. All right, are you getting a picture? Now we'll begin our reading. Lorraine Bettner writes, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism agree that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Okay? There's no difference between Roman Catholicism and, and, and Protestantism. They both agree that Scripture is the inspired word of God. Okay? Just nobody bothers to tell you that your Bible, your Protestant evangelical Bible, reads nothing like a Roman Catholic Bible. Okay. Now he continues. He says, but they differ widely. That is, Protestants and Catholics differ widely in regard to the place that it is to have in the life of the church. Okay. Protestants, if I have to remind you, is sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our authority is our instruction in faith and practice. The scriptures and the scriptures alone. That's Bible Protestantism. Okay? That's not at all what the Roman Catholic Church believes. Protestantism holds that the Bible alone is the authoritative and sufficient rule of faith and practice. But Romanism, that is Roman Catholicism, holds that the Bible must be supplemented, it must be supplemented by a great, vast body of tradition consisting of 14 or 15 apocryphal books. If you've ever heard of the apocrypha, let me tell you, the first edition of the, of the King James Version of the Bible included some of these 14 or 15 books. 
and eventually they were dropped. And in today's versions of the King James Bible, they no longer exist. Okay? They were claimed to be intertestamentary books that were written that were valuable for historical context, but they were included in the Bible as divine writ. And they are not divine writ. That's why the Protestants omitted them from God's holy word and relegated them to where they belong, in a library somewhere, okay? But Rome includes, continues to this day to include those 14 or 15 apocryphal books in their Bible, and they are regarded as divine writ, okay? Is that not putting words in God's mouth? Is that not adding to God's words and taking away from God's words, which is completely forbidden to do, repeatedly forbidden to do in the scriptures? You see how tradition already has nullified the Bible, the scriptures, the holy word of God? They perverted what God said. And that's why the Protestants rebelled. Okay? But Roman Catholicism holds that the Bible must be supplemented by a great body of tradition consisting 14 or 15 apocryphal books or portions of books equivalent, that is equal to about two-thirds of the volume of the New Testament and voluminous writings of the Greek and the Latin church fathers and a huge collection of church council pronouncements and papal decrees as of equal value and authority of the written word of God. A veritable library in itself. Okay? So you see what your Protestant and evangelical ecumenical, ecumenical evangelical belly pastors have bought for you? You can take a college education, a four-year degree in Roman Catholic tradition, and you won't know a tenth of it. Okay? If you're going to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, you're going to be responsible for these 14 or 15 apocryphal books because they're the ones who teach about purgatory and about auricular confession and about the sacrifice of the mass. They're what you need to learn to, to, to learn Roman Catholicism. 14 or 15 apocryphal books, and that isn't the start of it. Then you have to know the writings of the Greek and the Latin holy fathers, as they're called by the Roman Catholic Church. The writings of men, okay? Not the writings of the apostles. The writings of men who have been added to voluminously for the last 2,000 years. That's what you're going to be responsible for if you join this ecumenical re movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. Are you up to the task? 14 or 15 apocryphal books, all the writings, the voluminous writings of all the Greek and the Latin church fathers, and a huge collection of Roman Catholic Church of council pronouncements. You know that over the last 2,000 years, Rome has convened council after council after council, and they pretend that they're just as holy and just as necessary and just as much an act of God as was the Council of Jerusalem that was overseen by the apostles. Okay? And how about the and, Council of uh, Nicaea, Tom? Sure, which the Council was, of Nicaea. Which was called by the Emperor Constantine. Yeah. So it is a worldly leader, it is a secular leader, the emperor of the quote-unquote Roman Empire at that time, that called for the Council of Nicaea. And these church council pronouncements are regarded as valuable as the Bible. Right. But the council is not even called by the church as was the Council of Jerusalem that is written of in the Book of Acts. But this council was called for by the emperor. Yep. So, in other words, the pronouncements of the worldly emperor are equal to Holy Script 
and Roman Catholic Church tradition. That is something to think about, eh? Now that, that I reiterate, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but I have to continue and make the point. This is what your apostate, Protestant, and evangelical pastors are buying for you. They're making you Catholic with or without your knowledge and consent. Are you going to live with that? Okay. The author says all of these things together constitute a veritable library of information, which dwarfs the scriptures, relegates the scriptures to insignificance simply by volume alone. That's what you're getting when you go into Roman Catholicism. Now, do you understand why God rose up Mr. Lorraine Bettner to write this book, right smack dab in the middle of Vatican Council II? The very beginning of ecumenism in the Protestant and Evangelical churches, after 250 years of futurism being taught in your church, that the Antichrist won't be revealed till the end of time, completely exonerating both the papacy and the synagogue of Satan from being anything but a Christian church and a Christian leader. That's what they determined to do at the Council of Trent in 1540, 1560, back in those days, right after the Protestant Reformation. They declared an all-out war of annihilation of anybody that was not within the Roman Catholic Church. The death sentence was issued against Protestants and Evangelicals at the Council of Trent, and they, bla they blatantly and brazenly posted a hundred anathemas and damnations against the Protestant reformers. Does your pastor tell you anything about these things? Does your Protestant evangelical pastor, oh, he prays so pretty. He sings so pretty. He preaches so pretty. He bounces on his heels behind the pulpit. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us be rejoice and be glad in it, right? You just love him to death. But is he teaching you any of these things? If he's not, I ask you plainly, what good is he? Lorraine Bettner continues, he says, it's very evident that this difference of opinion concerning the authoritative basis of the church is bound to have radical and far-reaching effects. The age-long controversy between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, did you, listen, let me stop. Did anybody ever tell you that there was a controversy between the Protestant and Roman Catholic Church? Did your pastor or your Sunday school teacher or anybody in your family ever tell you that there was a controversy between the Protestant and the Roman Catholic Church? That controversy has fashioned history. You see it everywhere you turn in a history book. Does anybody point that out to you? Who's responsible to point out the controversy? that will forever exist between the Protestant and Evangelical churches and the Roman Catholic Church. Somebody's responsible to teach you these things. Who is he, if not your pastor? He says the age-long controversy between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism comes to a head regarding the question of authority. Right here, we believe is the basic difference between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. And we may add, we believe that it is its use of tradition is to be found the Achilles heel of Roman Catholicism. Now listen, I could argue and debate with, with, with the author uh, over this. I won't bother, but surely you can tell. The traditions of the Roman Catholic really dwarf the Bible in volume alone, does 
no other purpose than to reduce the Bible to a mere accessory in the Roman Catholic Church, if nothing else. That, according to this author, Mr. Lorraine Bettner, is the Achilles heel of Roman Catholicism. Okay? This is the weak spot of Roman Catholicism, according to Lorraine Bettner. This is what will topple the Roman Catholic Church. If everybody begins to believe and understand and comprehend that tradition, as it is held in the Roman Catholic Church, is literally the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church. It's the very thing that will prove to you beyond any doubt that it is not a Christian church and that it is blasphemy to call it a Christian church. He continues, he says, for it is in this that Romanism finds the authority for its distinctive doctrines. What derives the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church? The dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church? Not the Bible. The traditions. That which is supposedly passed down to the Roman Catholic Church by mouth that there is no written confirmation of. Roman Catholicism can literally say, who cares what God says? We have tradition. Take your Bible, read it all you like, but you must believe tradition. Is that what you want in your Christian life? Now, by now, already by now, you must begin to comprehend that your church, your church, the very church that you go to every Sunday is a very dangerous place. Now, let me tell you something else directly from the scripture. It plainly says, listen carefully to what it says. Take it literally, because it's meant to be taken literally. Here it is. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no marvel that his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. So where would you expect to find Satan's ministers? Pretending to be ministers of righteousness. Pretending to be ministers of the light. That's where you find them. And they're behind the pulpits of nearly every Protestant and evangelical church in this world. Now, many of you are going to find this too much to swallow. But swallow it, you must, if you're going to stand in the light and be there to denounce the darkness and call it for what it is especially in the face of what has transpired in the ecumenical movement that was began at the Second Vatican Council in 1962, when this book came out, when this Holy Spirit-inspired man by the name of Lorraine Bettner, at the very time when Rome was giving the ultimatum to God's people, the Protestant evangelical people, you either come back to Rome or else Lorraine Bettner came out with this book to tell you what it is that you would be uniting with if you went back to Rome. This is one of the most important books a person can read. And I encourage you all to get a copy of this book, Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Bettner, L-O-R-A-I-N-E. B-O-E-T-T-N-E-R. The book was first published in 1962 at the Council of Vatican Council II. Ecumenism was the big push at Vatican Council II. It was the consummation of the Council of Trent. The ultimatum that was given at the Council of Trent was fulfilled and enacted at Vatican Council II. And God rose up, Lorraine Bettner, to tell you what your pastor was going to buy for you at the Vatican Council II. And you need to know what it is. Okay? To reunite with the Roman Catholic Church is to reject Christ and make your bed 
with the man of sin in Rome. Now, every religious movement that develops some unity and continues to live has its traditions, okay? Tradition just comes with religion, doesn't it? I mean, even much of what was the divine worship of God by the Hebrews might be called by us tradition, right? That's not what we're talking about. He says, these traditions gather up the beliefs, the thinking, and the practice of the, and the rules of the group, particularly as these are expressed in its doctrinal standards and forms of government. In this manner, the movement gives stability to and regulates its own manner of life and hands that stability and manner of life on to the next generation. Okay? So not all tradition is bad, right? It's just how society works. But that's not what we're talking about. Lorraine Bettner says, we do not reject all tradition, but rather make judicious use of it insofar as it accords with scripture and is founded on the truth. We should, for instance, treat with respect and study with care the confessions and the council pronouncements of various churches, particularly those of the ancient church and of the Reformation days. Okay. Uh, I could name many of them, but they don't come to mind about now. But uh, uh, there have been many Protestant and evangelical uh, statements of faith. Okay that are the traditions of men. These are the things that we hold valuable in our Protestant and evangelical churches. They summarize basically anti-Catholicism. That's how they were written, to uh, oppose Rome and to establish a Protestant mindset, okay? That's what these ancient Protestant and evangelical councils uh, pr uh, produced. Okay, we should also give careful attention to the confessions and council decisions of the present day churches, scrutinizingly, uh, scrutinizing most carefully, of course, those of the denomination to which we belong. Now, let me check. I don't want to make a big deal out of this right now, but there's no denomination in the kingdom of heaven. There's no denominational divisions in the kingdom of heaven. So that's Tom Fress and Yerk Glissman. I know he agrees with me on this, and I can speak for him safely without violating his beliefs. There's no denomination in the truth. It's either the truth or it's not, okay? That's what we believe. And he says, uh, uh, we do not, uh, uh, but we do not give any church the right to formulate new doctrine or to make decisions contrary to the teachings of Scripture. Now, what did he just do? He just defined for you what Roman Catholicism is, okay? It's a church that's contrary to the teaching of Scripture. And it formulates new doctrines based on unbiblical sources. That is tradition, what we've been talking about, okay? What, Rome, what Bettner's telling you right now is Roman Catholicism is not Christianity by any stretch of the imagination, not by any stretch of the definition of a church. It is not Christianity. Now, he says, the history of the church at large shows all too clearly that church leaders and church councils can and do make mistakes, some of them serious. The author okay. here repeats what Martin Luther stated in Worms okay, when, when he was um, he was asked to come to Worms to recant of all his work, and he said, "Here I stand, because history shows that councils and popes have um, they contradicted one contradicted another. themselves." Yeah, and, and even church councils. This is exactly what Lorraine Bettner says here. So he, in a way, repeats what Martin Luther said in Worms. 
And Martin yeah. Luther came to the conclusion and said, if you cannot convince me by common sense or by scripture, I cannot and will not recant. God help me. Here I stand. God help me. Yeah. That's what he said. And this is exactly the same point that Rowan Bettner makes. I mean, sometimes, Tom, very important sentences, sentences are hidden in the text and you read above them and you just read through them and you just don't get the value of this. I think right. this is a very valuable little sentence. The history Absolutely. of the church at large shows all too clearly that church leaders, quote unquote, popes, and church councils can make mistakes, do make mistakes, and did make mistakes, some of them very serious. Sure. And I'm yeah. not even going into the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, or the Council of uh, Chalcedon, which within 130 years old dealt with the teaching of the Trinity. I'm not even going into that. But think of all the Lateran councils where the Inquisition and the Crusades were charged against the true Church of Jesus Christ. That's right. Those councils were convened to organize crusades to kill those who Roman Catholicism called heretics. And when they killed them, they thought they were doing God's service. Exactly as Jesus Christ foretold in the gospel. Exactly. They will exactly. kill you. They will throw you out of the synagogues. They will kill you. They will persecute and kill you and think they do God a good job. Yeah. That's right. And never once did Jesus command his people to kill heretics. Never once. So right away, you know, the Roman Catholic Church convened council after council after council to organize crusades against what they called heretical people. It literally exposes them to their true, their true identity. It's not a Christian church, never was a Christian church, never will be a Christian church. It is the synagogue of Satan. Okay? And the degree to which your Protestant and evangelical pastors have warmed up to the Roman Catholic Church and insisted that there be unity with the Roman Catholic Church, they are leading you down the primrose path to perdition. And you've got, if you can't restore your church to true biblical Protestantism, you have to get out. And I wouldn't let any time lapse. Satan is transformed in an, in, uh, an angel of light, and it's no marvel that his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, and they stand behind the pulpits of our churches, and they're leading us all down the primrose path to perdition. They are the most dangerous places a person can be in this day and age. You've got to get out of your church. Get Jesus and his book and read it and believe it like your life depended upon it and preach Christ and him crucified and to hell with all the hell-bound churches. To hell with all of the hell-bound churches because that's where they're heading and they want to take you with them. I don't want anybody to go. I staked my own life and all my earthly happiness on this. I've surrendered everything my entire life to warn God's people about the horror that is the, comp the modern day churches. And there's no repentance in me. No repentance in me. Consequently, their decisions should have no authority except as they are based on Scripture. This is a very different sentence, huh? a very difficult sentence. Because if their decisions have authority because they are based on Scripture, 
their decisions are superfluous because scripture says it already. They are just repeating what is written in God's word. Yep. So consequently, their decisions should have no authority except as they are based on scripture means their decisions should have no authority if they are not based on the scripture and everything that is based on scripture is just reading scripture it's just practicing scripture it's not just reading the bible it's consuming the bible it is eating the bible chewing it living it no decision should have authority except it's based on scripture so there is no decision to be taken because the Bible already tells you that decision. A sentence you should think about a little bit to understand completely. I'll give you a sentence. While all the pastors and the priesters are so beautifully preaching the ecumenical peace and love and unity, the scripture says this. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's what we're doing. It says Protestants differ from Roman Catholics in that they keep these standards strictly subordinate to Scripture. And in that they are ever ready to re-examine them for that purpose. Okay? Okay. Everything is passed through the filter of Scripture. Truth is determined by the Scripture and the Scripture alone. That's Protestantism. More than that, that's true biblical Christianity. That's first century apostolic Christianity. That's Berean Christianity. Everything must pass through the filter of the scriptures to be proven true. Didn't say anything about tradition, did it? And that's the foundation that the Protestant Reformation was built upon. The scripture and the scripture alone. Christ and Christ alone. Why did they say solo Christos? Because the Pope claimed to be the authority of the church. The Pope claimed to be the, the oracle of truth. The Pope claimed to be the light in the world. That's a lie. That won't pass the filter of the scriptures. Jesus is the rock and the foundation of the church, and we are all brethren. That runs diametrically counter to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. That the papacy is the rock and the foundation of the church and we are all his subjects. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches. And he has the authority as the head of the Roman Catholic Church to take your soul by force. And to persecute you into dust if you don't come along. And I've just described to you all of history. And what does the Bible say to confirm this? Quote, the righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. You know who the righteous are that perished that no one takes to heart? The countless saints of Almighty God that made their break with the harlot church of Rome, made their league with Christ and condemned with every fiber of their body the papal antichrist. They're the ones who died. They're the ones who the crusades were led against. They're the ones who were burned at the stake. They were the ones who were disemboweled. They're the ones whose children were taken and put in nunneries and monasteries to be raised up Roman Catholic. They're the ones who had all their property taken to enrich the, calf, the, cal, the coffers of the Roman Catholic Church. The saints of Almighty God, those who preached against the Antichrist of Rome. Are there any of those today? 
Do you know any standing behind a pulpit today that does that? Is there Are there any pastors in the world that could be qualified as a martyr of Jesus based on that standard? There are no martyrs today. There's only dead men. Protestants differ from Roman Catholics in that they keep these standards strictly subordinate to the Scripture, and in that they are ever ready to re-examine them for that purpose. In other words, they insist that in the life of the Church, Scripture is primary and denominational standards are subordinate or secondary. And I just reiterate what I said before, they shouldn't even be allowed. There should be no denominational differences between any of God's people. That's the division. Those who divide the saints are the ones who promote denominational differences. There's only one truth. There's only one Christianity. There ought always to have been unity in the body of Christ, never denominational division. And those who champion their denomination are exposing their error, and boasting about their error. There's nothing to boast about denominationalism. It's a sign of our failure and weakness. Okay? He says they thus use their traditions with one controlling caution. They continually ask if this or that aspect of their belief and practice is true to the Bible. Just like the Bereans. That's true biblical Christianity. That's apostolic Christianity. That's the only true Christianity. You think you're going to get that in the Roman Catholic Church? He says they subject every statement of tradition to that test. And they are willing to change any element that fails to meet that test. Okay? That's true biblical Christianity. That the is Bible put, and the Bible alone. That is put into practice from chapter 17 of the book of Acts, verses 10 and 11. Right ahead. Um, yeah, I can only cite a little bit from, uh, from my memory. Um, it's when Paul came to Berea. And uh, they found that the Jews in Berea were better Jews than those in Thessalonica because they measured everything by the Bible daily. Yep. And um, that's what we should do. Yep. And that is the only quote unquote tradition we should hold up. We should hold up. There you measure go. everything against the Bible. And if it is not confirmed in the Bible, then it is to be disposed of then it is anti-biblical. And anti-biblical means anti the word of God. Choose yep. this day whom you're going to serve. God or Antichrist. Now, based on what Yerk just said, what do we conclude conclusively about a church whose traditions dwarf the scriptures many times over? and which is touted to be equal with the scriptures in importance, and which no one can verify from any divine writ. They're passed down auricularly. Okay? You can't check anything. The Roman Catholic Church, literally with its oral traditions, can preach anything it wants, and it does. Is that what your pastor is leading you to? Is that what you're ecumenically reuniting with? Is that where your destiny lies? Good question, Tom. That's right. In contrast to this, Roman Catholics hold that there are two sources of authority. Scripture and, listen to the word, Scripture and developing tradition. In other words, it changes, it develops. The traditions of the Roman Catholic Church are living. They change daily, right? Okay? Scripture is mentioned here, but developing tradition 
with the church being the judge of Scripture and therefore able to say authoritatively what the right interpretation of Scripture is. Did you know it's the official teaching dogma of the Roman Catholic Church that you may not read the Scriptures and interpret it any other way than but by the by the unanimous consent of the fathers. That is the Catholic fathers. The Greek and Latin church fathers, as the author That's called right. them on the page before we read. Mm -hmm. Tom, I, I, I thought this was a good point to make a stop for the session today because okay. we are over one hour already and we don't want to oh. extend the attention span of our uh, viewers too much. And uh, we can save something for the next reading. So I just thought that we are going to take a little break here uh, okay. for the very first reading. And we, we now established what uh, the Protestants thought of this side. Now you are going in the next uh, paragraph into what Roman Catholic thinks about that. And that's probably the whole rest of the chapter, of course. Um, yeah. And I think that it, that was a wonderful beginning of, uh, of, of the reading and discussing of this book. Um, and as you see, uh, what you read was word for word what was written here in the PDF. So it is easy okay. in the PDF to follow. Uh, I can take over the reading whenever your voice fails you, whatever, okay. next time. Um, I'm very glad we did this, Tom. I'm very glad that we are back with Hour of the Truth and Inquisition update and that we have something to share for our viewers that will probably, hopefully, as we pray, give them some support in these final days that we are living in, where yes. the living in this world becomes more difficult day by day. In the United States, where you live, yeah. in Europe, where I live, in Asia, where other people live, in Africa, all around the world, it is harder and harder and harder. And if you do not have anything to hold on to, you are totally lost. What yeah. should you hold on to? the Word of God. And Tom and I read the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, which we think is the most profound, preserved Word of God in the days that we have it today. And you should hold on to that. You should read it daily. You should study it. You should eat it, swallow it, ruminate on it, and just live the Bible. And right. let the Bible determine your actions. And by that, show that you are different from the world and that you are different from the synagogue of Satan and the Roman Catholic Church. Those were my five cents. And I leave the conclusion of the reading for today for Tom. Please, Tom. Yeah, I won't, I won't belabor the point. Believe God and reject the commandments of men. Believe God and reject the traditions of men. We've got to get our priorities straight. Because in this world, deception rules and reigns. And the most authoritative voices in the Christian world are apostates. Futurist apostates who will not accept the fact that Jesus fulfilled perfectly and completely the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. That is the ministry of Christ. And they say that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, which can mean no other than Jesus was not the fulfillment of it. What do you think of that? They profess Christ with their mouth and they turn right around and deny that he ever came. Futurism is a lie. It's a damnable lie. It's a damnable heresy. And it positively identifies an apostate, one who should be rebuked and replaced as soon as possible. Thanks, Yerk. Bye.
they say 